Sabbath School, the church that study this morning here in Anderson, Indiana, on the 14th of August, 2021. I'm glad that all of you are with us this morning as we continue our study about rest. And uh, we are on Lesson 7, which means that uh, we're halfway through this quarter already. Time is flying by here again this year, and um, we will uh, be studying rest, relationships, and healing. Rest, relationships, and healing will be our study topic for today. And those of you that have your study guide with you or if you're at home, uh, it is going to start on page 56 is where we're going to begin. But before we get started, let's have a word of prayer as we open up the scriptures this morning. Father, which art in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be together here this morning. We pray now as we open up the scriptures that you will guide and direct in a very special way. Send the Holy Spirit in amidst us today and be with the folks that are at home viewing us on the internet. Be with them as they are participating and studying this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share with you a reading this morning. It's from a book called Sons and Daughters of God. Sons and Daughters of God is what it's from. And um, we will uh, want to share this with you. And it's entitled, In Forgiveness, is what it is entitled. Christ, our perfect pattern in daily living. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23, 34. Luke 23, 34. Christ is our example. He placed himself at the head of the human family to accomplish a work, the importance of which men do not comprehend because they do not realize the privileges and possibilities before them as members of the human family of God. His mercy was not weakness, but a terrible power to punish sin, yet a power to draw to it the love of humanity. Through Christ, justice is enabled to forgive without sacrificing one jot of its exalted holiness. Christ taught us to pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and added, for if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive your trespasses. Will you not, if anyone has done you a wrong and is too proud and stubborn to say to you, I repent, go to the offender and say, I love you for Christ's sake and I forgive you the injury that you've done me. Jesus will witness and approve of this deed of love, and as you do to others, it shall be done again to you. We are to have a spirit of pity and of compassion toward those who have trespassed against us, whether or not they confess their faults. If they fail to repent and make confession, their sins will stand registered in the books above to confront them in the day of judgment. Think about that one. Think about that. If they fail to repent and make confession, their sins will stand registered in the books above to confront them in the day of judgment. But if they say, I repent, then we are freely to forgive from the heart their trespasses against us. That's some serious business there. True happiness does not consist in the possession of wealth or position but in the possession of a pure, clean heart, cleansed by obedience to the truth. To everyone is given the opportunity to carry out the principles of heaven, the forgiving of injuries, not the avenging of them, is an exhibition of that wisdom which is true goodness. Christ-like love for the men through whom the Lord has wrought is a manifestation of of real transformation of character. Real transformation of character. Now that's some things to think about this morning. Particularly this one that I said there. Said, if they fail to repent and make confession. That's all of us here. 
their sins will stand registered in the books above to confront them in the day of judgment. Hmm. Mm-mm. That's something to think about. Sure is. Well, we have been talking about who? Who have we been talking about the last couple of weeks? Joseph and all the things that he ran into and the rest that he had in relationship to rest in Jesus Christ as far as going off to another country, another land. I mean, you think about that. Doesn't know the language, different language down in Egypt than what he's been speaking. And he's taken captive, sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites, as we talked about last week. You know, they were related, cousins. And off they went down to Egypt. Well, today we're going to open up the scriptures and continue. And you'll notice what Genesis 45.5 says here on page 56. It says, but now... Do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. What was going on back home that was a real problem? Back where he came from. What were they faced with? Famine. Famine. Drought. You know, we may think right now, and I do, that we're in drought, at least out at my place we are. We haven't seen any rain in a few weeks. Water table is not as good as it should be. But can you imagine, can you imagine now, seven years drought? Seven years. You know, they had seven years of plenty, which they stored everything up, you know, in the storehouses. And then they went into seven years of drought. I mean, I I can't even, my mind can't even uh, imagine that. You know, I make my living in agriculture. And if I don't have water, just in one season, I can lose a lot. Well, if you don't get any water through the winter, then uh, what do you have there? You know, the water table keeps going lower and lower. Nothing's going to grow the next year and so forth, but seven years. And they had animals. Animals take food. You know, they eat the grass and so forth. And, you know, it's, you know, when you think about a drought, and the impact it has. We're seeing it here in this country right now, out west. They're in a drought out in California. And um, that's where a lot of our food comes from for the United States, is from that part of the, the uh, uh, country. But seven years of plenty, and then seven years, no food. Can't grow anything. So, when we see this and we look at this story, you'll notice here, it says on page 56 is where I am in the study guide. A man had been accused of sexually assaulting a woman. She positively identified him in a police lineup. Though evidence made his guilt questionable, the woman was adamant that Johnny was the guilty party. And so Johnny went to uh, prison where he rotted for 14 years for a crime that he did not commit. Only when DNA evidence exonerated him did the woman, Joan, realize her terrible mistake. She wanted to meet Johnny after he had been released. What would this man who had suffered so much do when he came face to face with a woman who had ruined his life for so many years. She was in a room waiting for him to come, and when he did, and they looked each other in the eyes, Joan burst into tears. Johnny just leaned down and took my hands, and he looked at me and said, I forgive you. I couldn't believe it. 
Here was this man whom I had hated and whom I wanted only to die. And yet now here he was telling me who had done him so much wrong that he forgave me. Only then did I begin to understand what grace was really about. And only then did I begin to heal and have true rest. Only then. Can you imagine being accused of a crime that you did not commit? Going to prison. Those of you that have been on the prison ministry, you know what that place is like. And be there for 14 years for something that you didn't do. And then to have the ability that he did when they met, I forgive you. You know, forgiveness is not something that comes natural. And it's not something that we can conjure up by ourselves. Forgiveness is something that comes through the power of God. You know, you can go out and do a lot of things for yourself. But bringing forgiveness about is not one of those things that you can do. It is through the power of God that forgiveness can come about. Well, let's take a look here on page 57 in your study guide. It says, read about the first encounter between Joseph and his brothers since they sold him into slavery. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 42, and we're going to read from verse 7 to verse 20. And Juan, if you would start out, please, with verse 7, 8, and 9. Kathy, 10, 11, and 12. Madonna, 13, 14, and 15. And Jennifer, finish it up, please, 16 through 20. Genesis chapter 42 is where we are. And one, when you're ready, go ahead, 7, 8, and 9. Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them, but he acted as a stranger to them and spoke roughly to them. Then he said to them, Where do you come from? And they said, From the land of Canaan, to buy food. So Joseph recognized his brother, but they did not recognize him. Then Joseph remembered the dreams which he had dreamed about them and said to them, You are spies. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. You are spies. You've come to see the nakedness of the land. They didn't know who he was. They didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. And, um, I mean, it's been years now since this has happened. Kathy, go ahead, please. No, sir, they insisted. We are humble people and are here to buy food for our families. We are all brothers, Your Excellency. You are honest men, not spies. Or we are honest men, not spies. Joseph shot back, no, you have come here to find any weak spots in our defenses. You've come here to find weak spots in our defenses. You are spies now. See, this is the second time now that he's told them they're spies. He told them that at the beginning. Now here it is the second time. You're nothing but spies. Madonna, go ahead, please. What verses was it? 13, 14, and 15. But they replied, Your servant were twelve brothers, the sons of one man who lives in the land of Canaan. The youngest is now with our father, and one is no more. Joseph said to them, It is just as I told you. You are spies, and this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. Unless your youngest brother comes here. Again, he's told them you're nothing but spies. You know, that's the third time now. You are spies. You are spies. You know, you, you keep, when you think about this, you keep coming at them. You are spies. You are spies. You know, trying to, to break them down. Go ahead, 16 through 20, please. Send one of you and let, the, and let him bring your brother while you remain confined 
that your words may be tested whether there is truth in you, or else, by the life of Pharaoh, surely you are spies. And he put them all together in custody for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, Do this and you will live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers remain confined where you, where you are in custody, and let the rest go and carry grain for the famine of your household, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your wor words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. So your words will be verified, and you shall not die. Now, keep in mind, they've been, he's told them now they're spies four times. And, you know, if you're a spy in another country, you know what the penalty for that is. That's death. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's no debate about it. It's, it's just death. That's the way that it's treated and that's the way it's handled. And so, you know, they're in a, in a hard uh, place here. And um, notice some of the words he uses in verse 19, if you are honest men. If you are honest men. So, I mean, he's really testing them and trying to find out where they are. It's been many years since he's seen them. Doesn't know if they've really changed or not. But that's what he's doing, really testing them here to see what it is. Um, let's take a look at uh, Matthew 25. Matthew 25, 41 to 46. Matthew, would you read that for us, please? Matthew 25, verses 41 to 46. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into, ever, into eternal life. Think about those verses. We've read those verses before here in our study, different points in time. And again, he says, on the left, depart from me, you curse it into the everlasting per, uh, for the devil and his uh, angels. And he goes right down through it, for I was hungry, didn't give me food. I was in prison, you didn't come see me. You know, as I've mentioned before, when you look at this, there's a lot of good things people are doing out there today. A lot of good things people are doing here in our congregation. There's a lot of good things going on in other congregations around the world. A lot of good things where people are going to the prison. They've got other uh, groups that they're working with, substance abuse groups, whatever the case may be. And, you know, when I read these verses, and, you know, I can't read anybody's heart in this room this morning. Can't do that. Only God does. But when I read these verses and how serious this is, if we're going through the motions, if we're going through the motions, what is going to happen there on the judgment day? It tells you right here. It's going to, I don't know who you are. And in our minds, we can think, well, hey, We've been doing pretty good work. 
been going here, been fixing meals, been going to the prison when we could in those days, been doing all of these things. But then, I don't know who you are. Now, that's, that's pretty serious because there's no, there's no second chance at that point. So, you know, we have to do some inner seeking of ourselves and looking at ourselves. Well, why am I doing this? It's not about mounting up points. It's not on a point system that if you get so many points, you know, you'll be welcomed into heaven. It's not that. It's taking the character of Jesus Christ into our hearts and that relationship with Jesus Christ that these things just come natural and we don't stop and think and say, well, we got this, this, and this. Go ahead, Juan. I, I just want to remind the, the, the two sins by we are accused at the end of the time is commission and omission. And there, it's right there. It's the thing that we have done wrong, but the thing that we, have, that we should have been doing and we didn't do it. God, God, God is going to ask us for the thing that we were supposed to do, but we didn't do. And, and that's why the question is why God takes so seriously our relation with our uh, uh, person around us. We're supposed to help them in, in, in whatever way possible we can. Right. Yeah, very good. Very good. Well... It, um, as you look at this, down at the bottom, it says, We've all been bought through Jesus' blood, and legally we are all his. Anyone who is abusive is attacking Jesus' property. Sexual abuse and emotional or physical violence are never to be a part of a family dynamics. This is not just private family business to be resolved internally. This will require outside help and intervention. And if you or someone in your family is being abused, please get help from a trusted professional. You know, years ago, growing up as a kid, that kind of stuff, it's always gone on. But back in those days, there really wasn't a whole lot said publicly or, or seeking out. Today, it's different. And that's in a matter of 50 years how things have changed. Because when I was growing up as a kid, those kind of things, uh, people would suspect certain things, but it wasn't a, an active situation where people got actively involved. And uh, today, completely different. Completely different in relationship to that. And uh, people seeking out help and getting help because it is not... A natural thing. Let me share this with you on page 48 of the companion book and page 49. It says, Christ is our only hope. We may look to him for he is our savior. We may take him at his word and make him our dependence. He knows just the help that we need and we can safely put our trust in him. If we depend on merely human wisdom to guide us, we shall find ourselves on the losing side. But we may come direct to the Lord Jesus, for he has said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. It is our privilege to be taught of him. We have a divine audience to which to present our requests, then let nothing present us prevent us from offering our petitions in the name of Jesus, believing with unwavering faith that God hears us and that he will answer us. Let us carry our difficulties to God, humbling ourselves before him. And that's from a book called Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers is where that comes from. And um, taking our load and, and putting it upon him. Let's take a look now on page 58. On page 58, it says, setting the stage. Notice that first sentence there. It says, Joseph had forgiven his brothers. 
And it tells us we don't know exactly when that happened, but it was obviously long before they showed up. Now, notice here the question. What did Joseph overhear? Let's take a look at Genesis chapter, or chapter 42, verses 21 to 24. Mel, you want to read that for us, please? Genesis chapter 42, 21 to 24. The question is, what did Joseph overhear, and what did he learn about his brothers? Go ahead, please. Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear. Therefore the distress has come upon us. And Reuben answered them, saying, Did I not speak to you, saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Therefore, behold, his blood is now required of us. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. And he turned himself away from them and wept. Then he returned to them again and talked with them, and said, Sim Simeon from them and bound bef him before their eyes. Now, thank you. Now, when you look at this, you see um, the situation is, Right there in verse 21. We're truly guilty. We did it. And of course, all the time, they didn't know that he could understand them because he used an interpreter. But they, you know. And Reuben, I told you so. You ever, you ever heard that one? I told you. I told you so. And that's what he says. Did I not speak to you saying, do not sin against the boy? You wouldn't listen. I told you. Look where we are today, Mike. When Joseph was taken out of prison, it says that they cleaned him up and put him in clothes. Pharaoh made him the viceroy of Egypt, which meant he was a ruler and had to look like an Egyptian. They didn't recognize him because he was in Egyptian garb. And an Egyptian wife, they had no idea. That's why they didn't recognize him. I mean, I've ran into people that I went to school uh, back in high school and hadn't seen in 40 years. And they Michael, you know, they recognized me. It's because he was in the Egyptian garb. Yeah, yeah, he was fitting in with with the surroundings there, fitting in. Well, notice here in verse 24, who did they take? Who did Joseph take? Simeon, why? He was the instigator of the first problem. Yeah, he was. He was the instigator of the problem to begin with. And so they, he took Simeon. That wasn't by chance. That was for a reason. But you just told me. And, you know, when you look at this, you know, it talks about Joseph weeping. A lot of shedding of tears here. And, you know, if you've ever been in a situation where you've uh, asked for forgiveness or if you are receiving forgiveness, uh, on the, you know, you're on the receiving end, and many times there'll be a lot of weeping and crying over this. And this was no exception here in this situation at all. I hope that you've read this because I would like to have some response now. At the bottom of page 58, Genesis 45, 1 through 15. And what does this tell us about how Joseph felt about his brothers and the forgiveness that he had given them? What lessons should we take away from this story for ourselves? Genesis 45, 1 through 15. What did you see there? What did you read and, and study to share with us at this time from that? I think that's a very emotional story in the Bible. That's one of those that sometimes you say, wow, this, this, is, this is huge. It's just, I, one of the things that I 
see is the willingness of justice to forgive his brother and, and not uh, blaming his brothers for things that they really did. He said, well, the, this, this was the plan of God. The, that's why I'm here today. And what is coming is bad. It's gonna be, it's gonna be seven years of famine and it's not gonna, it's, it's, this is not gonna stop for now. It's gonna be for a long time. So all you did was God's directing things so I can save lives. Not only the lives of, of the Egyptian, but the life of my family, the, your life. And he didn't see all that happened to him as a cruelty, just a cruelty of his brother and all that kind of thing. He saw it as a plan of God for him to be in that position. To be there. Right. Jennifer. I read in the first few verses that Joseph wept out loud, and it was so loud that all the household could hear him crying. And Joseph wasn't being forgiven in this case. He was giving the forgiveness. And so you might think that um, he hadn't done anything wrong, so he's not crying. But in reality, when we give forgiveness, we give part of ourselves. There's a cost that has to be paid, which reminds me of... Jesus on the cross in that he wept out loud to God because he was giving a piece of himself to cover humanity's sin and that was painful. Anytime we truly forgive someone, we give a piece of ourselves for that forgiveness. And so it's important to rem remember for me that I haven't truly forgiven someone unless I've taken it to God, agonized a little bit over it, and given a part of myself, and then I can truly forgive. And you know, when you think about that in relationship to what she just spoke to as far as truly forgiving, um, that you can take that a little bit further in relationship to if you've truly forgiven somebody, will you remember next week next month if something comes up in relationship to that person you understand what I'm what I'm saying and putting out there Mike first uh, I'm always amazed how God leads and, and prepares the way I mean before Joseph was even thrown in the pit his cousins were en route <laughs> and and then Joseph in turn is there in Egypt to save his family, ultimately. But my real point that I wanted to make this morning is uh, Peter asked Jesus a question, how many, how many times do I forgive my brother? And Jesus gave him this fantastic number. I mean, it might not seem big to us, but it did in Peter's mind. But he also taught us because the disciples then asked him, how do we pray? And what did he say? Our Father, which art in heaven, which yeah. art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then what did he say? Forgive us our debts. Forgive us our debts as... The emphasis is that we have to forgive others, not if they ask. We have to have a spirit of forgiveness in us in order to be able to go to God and be forgiven. Uh -huh. If we're holding something against somebody, we need to examine that. As, as Jennifer says, you know, you, you've got to go to God and agonize with this. You know, Why am I holding this against this person? Help me with this issue. Thank you. I want to share this with you. Um, it's on page 50 of the little companion book. It says, Jesus gladly forgave his brethren. Huh. Did you catch that word? Gladly? Gladly forgave his brethren and sent them away abundantly provided with provisions and carriages and everything necessary for the removal of their father's family and their own to Egypt. He gave his brother Benjamin more valuable presents than to his other brothers. As he sent them away, he charged them, See that ye fall not out by the way. He was afraid that they might enter into a dispute, 
and charge upon one another the cause of their guilt in regard to their cruel treatment of himself. With joy they return to their father. Sandra? To me, uh, one of the things that I've experienced in my life or have witnessed with other people about forgiveness and about things that bad things happen to good people, okay? Also, bad things happen that God can turn around and use for good. I have a hard time in my mind maybe saying, well, God caused the brothers to throw him in the pit and, you know, I, but I can see that those circumstances then led to this, that God took that and, you know, made it to be something positive. Sure. Um, working with bad things in my own experience or ministering to other people and talking with them who have gone especially through abusive situations, the forgiveness doesn't help the other person. The forgiveness helps me or the person that has been abused or hardened in some way or hurt by somebody. Because as long as we keep thinking about that, it festers and festers. That other person doesn't know anything about it, and they don't care anything about it. But the lift and the freedom that you have once you have forgiven that other person, they may never know about it. You may never have any contact with them. Mm -hmm. But that opens your heart and your mind and your soul to peace because you have given that up to God. Right, right, exactly. Thank you. One more yeah. point, Jesse. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, again, the Bible is, it writes things in, in broad strokes, and, we, and we, we can only surmise some of the details. We can get insight from Ellen White's writings and other writings. Stop and think about those brothers that are headed back to see their father. They're enjoying forgiveness from Joseph. They could have been killed by Joseph. He could have taken revenge. But they were enjoying the forgiveness. They had to make a confession to their father. You know, they didn't just go back and say, hey, he was alive, and ignore what happened. They had to tell their father what they had done. Mm -hmm. So they were going through a humbling time as well. And, and can you imagine that? You know, it's been many years, and, and you're heading back home, and, you know, yeah, we've got to tell him. Tell him the truth now. Lawrence. With relationship to what Sandra said, and I know you read this in the teacher's helps, not, not forgiving is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Not forgiving is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. Yep. Very true. Dennis. I believe everything everybody said. Uh, I tell you what hurts me, Jess. Let's let's get it down here. It hurts me when I have two friends that are, are angry with each other over nothing. I mm -hmm. mean, absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. And not only does it affect their relationships, which you mentioned, it hurts me. It affects me. Sure. I'm pulled in two different directions. Sure. I want to bring these people together. I want there to be the peace. And I really appreciate all the stories in the Bible. This one about Joseph. He forgave his family, his brothers, for what they did to him. And he saw, like someone else mentioned, God had a plan. And this was the plan. And he recognized that. God has a plan for each one of us. And we need to recognize what that plan is. The Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. For what? They shall inherit Herit eternal the earth. life. Yeah. Yeah. Deborah. I have experienced difficult forgiveness in my own life. And... The person I needed to forgive, I held a grudge against that person for 25 years. 
and it ate at me like a cancer. I was physically ill, I was emotionally distraught, and the person subsequently died. And I thought, how can I forgive this person? They're dead. But God showed me through reading the scriptures and through reading the story about Joseph that forgiveness is for my benefit. And I forgave the man who abused me. And uh, my life, it was like a total load had been lifted off my shoulders. And I could again interact with other people in a normal way. I wasn't constantly dwelling on the bad things that had happened. It was as if the slate had been wiped clean. And God, be, to God be the glory, I have never had a bad thought about that person to this day. Good, very good, thank you for sharing. Thank you. Let's take a look at page 59. Forgive and forget. Notice there's a question mark there. I guess you could, you know, you could have put a period there, forgive and forget. But they didn't. They got a question mark. That's a pretty big question mark for each of us this morning as you look at that, forgive and forget. Because it goes down through here and it talks about, it asks you a question, what does forgiving others do for us? And it refers us to Matthew 18, 21 to 35, which I hope that you've read. We're not going to be reading that out loud here this morning. But I touched on this just a little bit ago. Forgiving, that's an aspect here of what we're talking about this morning. But the second part of that is forget. When you think about your life this morning as you're sitting here, and you've had to probably ask forgiveness, and what those of you that are married, I'm just going to dwell on that as the scenario and not, you know, just anybody that you meet or somebody in the church. But think about your spouse. And your spouse does something to you. We'll, we'll play that scenario out. Your spouse does something to you and you say, well, they come back to you a few hours later and they say, well, do you forgive me? And... You say, well, yes, yeah, I forgive you. But then ask yourself, well, did I forget that? And, you know, if, if we're honest with ourselves, and some of you were shaking your heads up or down or whatever at me, you know, that's why there's a question mark there. Forgive and forget. Juan, go ahead. Well, I always have talked about that with, um, I mean, family and friends about how can God forget? I mean, can God forget anything? I think in the sense that we have to forget is in the sense not to bring whatever happened back and throw it into the face to the person. Do you remember what you did to me 20 years ago or whatever time? I, 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 um, uh, I am in the same situation with Deborah. I mean, I, I struggle with my own life being a young and in, in relation with my father because I saw the breaking of my father and my mother. I saw, I remember, I was 11 years, just like my son is now. And I saw that my father came to my house drunk. And my father was not violent or with anything, but that day he was a little bit like out of control. And I remember he's taking one of the, the arm of the, 
so far and, and raising in a position like to, help, to hit my mother. And my oldest brother was there. And he intervened and that didn't happen. Well, after that, he said that uh, that was not his, his intention, that he was just trying to scare her, whatever excuse. And for many, many years, I remember I struggled with that. I mean, I recognize him as my father and everything, but like, I remember, I remember what you did. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what you did was not very nice. Mm -hmm. That was for many years after I became an adult and studying the Bible and everything. And I said, man, I, I have to forget all, all this thing that happened. And after I forget all, all things, as, as Deborah said, my life changed. My relation with my father changed. My father became a Christian. And everything seems to, I, I, I wouldn't say just because of that, because I have other siblings. And I don't know what their feelings are, but, but my own feeling was that I, I was not like in a plan to forget my father. In some way, Jesus touched my heart and said, you have to forget about that. I remember everything that happened. I can forget that. I, but I don't have any bad sentiments about that. And I know God, because my mother forget my father too. And my, my mother was willing to accept back, not as, not a, a, as a husband, but to accept my father to live in the house. And I remember she said, I'm willing to cook for him. I'm, I'm willing to do uh, wash his clothes and everything. I don't want to have him more as my husband, but he can be back in the house because my father was homeless. He was living elsewhere. I mean, he has a little house, but he didn't have anybody to take care of him. And he was getting old. And she was willing to do that. So I understand that my mother also forgave my father. And I forget my father. And I remember one of my sisters, she was the one who almost dragged my father to the church. Come, come, there is a conference. There is a very interesting subject going on in the church. And after that, he accepted Jesus. And he became a Christian. So I think we can forget everything, but we have to be willing to put that away. And that's not important. The important thing is what happened after that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Mike. God has capacity to forget. What's he say he's going to do with our sins when we confess them? Put them in the depths of the sea? Our battle is primarily from our eyeballs up. Satan isn't going to let us forget. But if we choose, we can immediately, when it comes to our mind, go to Christ and say, I know you've forgiven. I mean, we've got to forgive ourselves, too, when we, when we confess a sin. If, if we confess a sin to Jesus and then, oh, we've got to learn to forgive ourselves, too, and move on. You know, a real quick story. And, and Juan, that was a very touching testimony. This is a true story. This uh, man uh, in the 1930s was a switchman in Philadelphia. And uh, he was drunk, but his boss told him to go out and switch so that the freight train can go on a different rail. He got out there and fell down asleep, and the switch didn't get switched. And this freight train hit a passenger train. And there were hundreds of people killed. Fast forward in the 60s. This nurse one night calls the chaplain that's on duty. And his last name was Moynihan. And he comes and he says, what's going on? Well, this man has no family. He's been an alcoholic all his life. He's going to be probably dying tonight. I didn't know if maybe you'd sit with him a while. So at 3 in the morning, he goes in, and uh, he talks to this guy and says, Hey, I was just passing by, and I thought I'd stop in and check on you. And he looked at him, and he said, 
you weren't just passing by. You're a minister, aren't you? And so they went on, and the minister talked, and the other guy was silent. Almost at daybreak, the guy started crying. And he says, I, I need to confess. I didn't switch that switch in Philadelphia, and all those people were killed. And I know God can't forgive me. And the minister said to him, he said, uh, on such and such a date? He said, yes. He said, well, my family was in the rear car, and my mother and dad and sister were killed. And if I can forgive you, and I do, I know God can forgive you. You know, we, we enjoy hearing stories like that, but forgiveness is like throwing a stone into a calm lake. It has ripple effects. Same with our sins, it has ripple effects, but so will the forgiveness. It will be a seed that will sprout. It will spread, exactly. Sure will. Notice at the very bottom of page 59, it says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. That's from Romans 4, 7 and 8. And when you look at that, it says, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. And that is very important and very powerful. I want to share with you something from page 51 of the companion book. I'm at the first paragraph under Wednesday, and uh, this is what we're talking about now. We're on page 60 of our study guide, page 51 of the uh, other book here. It says, the cross of Calvary appeals to us in power, affording a reason why we should love our Savior and why we should make him first and last and best in everything. We should take our fitting place in humble penitence at the foot of the cross here as we see our Savior in agony, the Son of God dying, the just for the unjust. We may learn lessons of meekness and lowliness of mind. Behold him who with one word would, could summon legions of angels to his assistance a subject of jest and merriment, of rivalry and hatred, he gives himself a sacrifice for sin. When reviled, he threatens not. When falsely accused, he opens not his mouth. He prays on the cross for his murderers. He is dying for them. He is paying an infinite price for every one of them. He bears the penalty of man's sins without a murmur. Without a murmur. It goes on to the next page. The teacher from heaven, no less a personage from the Son of God, came to earth to reveal the character of the Father to men, that they might worship him in spirit and in truth. Christ revealed to men the fact that the strictest adherence to ceremony and form would not save them. For the kingdom of God was spiritual in its nature. He presented to men that which was exactly contrary to the representations of the enemy in regard to the character of God. And he sought to impress upon men the paternal love of the Father, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life. It says here, under making it practical on page 60, it says, what does Jesus' declaration on the cross tell us about the timing of forgiveness? Notice, and it refers you to Luke 23, verse 34. Luke 23, 34. Let's turn to that and look at that. Luke 23, verse 34, and see what it says. Talking about the timing here on the cross. The timing on the cross. 23, verse 34. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. 
and they divided his garments and they cast lots for his garments. Now, notice here what it is. He's asking for forgiveness for his murderers as the act was being committed. As the act is being committed, he's asking for forgiveness for them. Notice what it says there. Jesus didn't wait for us to ask for forgiveness. Didn't wait for us to ask forgiveness first. We do not have to wait for our offenders to ask for forgiveness. We can forgive others without having them accept our forgiveness. That's a very important point. We can forgive others without having them accept our forgiveness. It goes on here and says in Luke 6, 28, and Matthew 5, 44, how we should relate to those who hurt us. What did you find there when you read that? How should we relate to those who hurt us? In Luke 6, 28. What are we supposed to do? In Luke 6, 28, what does it tell us? Yes. Dennis? Have you ever hurt anybody's feelings? Have you? Well, I have. Those that I love, I've hurt. And uh, I remember one time I hurt my family, Larry and Jane. And uh, I was wrong. I knew I was. And with tears in my eyes, I went to him. And you know Larry, big old rough voice, but as gentle as a lamb. And we took part with communion. I remember we had the ordinance of humility, and we're washing each other's feet. And I asked him to forgive me for what I did. You know what he told me? He said, Den... You were forgiven before you ever asked. What love. That's the kind of love that Jesus has for each one of us. And this morning, we need to do that. We need to ask somebody to forgive us for our feelings. But that love that Larry showed me when he said, you were forgiven before you ever asked. Yeah. I married the right girl because yeah. I got the right family. I'm right. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, Matthew 6, 28, if you've turned to it by now, I hope you have. Bless those who curse you. Huh. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. Spitefully use you, take advantage of you, uh, maybe uh, clip you in a business deal, uh, shortchange you uh, hundreds or thousands of dollars, or whatever the case may be. Or maybe they didn't do something right that they were supposed to do for you, some kind of a business situation or transaction. And it tells you right there, you're to bless them and pray for them who spitefully use you. But you say, well, I'm right. I know I'm right. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you are. But what it tells us is that we're to bless those who curse us and pray for those who despitefully use us. And then look at the next one, Matthew 5, 44. Matthew 5, 44. You know what the takeaway there is in Matthew 5, 44? Love your who? Enemies. Love your enemies and do what? Bless or do good to those that, that hurt you or hate you, whatever your translation is. Oh, boy. Love your enemies. Do good to those that hate you. 
Does that come from our hearts naturally? No, I don't think so. That has to be something that comes from, from God. Has to be. Because it's not going to come naturally from our hearts. To love our enemies and do good to those people that hate us. You know, if there's somebody out there that you know hates you, usually you're going to stay away. Keep your distance. And... Um, Try to protect yourself, I guess, is the word I'll use. Go ahead, Jennifer. Usually I talk about this at a different time, but it kind of brings me back to step four, which we've already discussed in our 12 steps of recovery. And that's where we sit and make a list, and a lot of people think that it's a list of all the people who've done bad things to us, and we're going to look at that list and we're going to say, I forgive you, and then we're just going to burn the list and it's all over. And that is not what it's about. And it's done with a lot of agonizing, and it's one of the toughest, most difficult, most honest steps that you have to work. And I just find that when people go into it with the mindset of, I have to forgive other people, they're missing the point. And so when we make that list, we look at those we've harmed. And it's not just, I, I yelled at my kid today. We have to dig a little deeper. But when we find somebody who's harmed us and we're looking to forgive them and we know we didn't do anything in that situation, it's really important to look at what we did directly after that because we too need forgiven. We reacted in a way. Whether it was positive, then that's good. If it was negative, then we need to forgive ourselves and it helps us to forgive the other person. So that kind of just ties in with our recovery steps. Right. Thank you. Yeah, sure does. Taking a look at some things here, finding rest after forgiveness. Very quickly, Mike. Galatians 5, 13. For you have been called to live in freedom, not freedom to satisfy your sinful nature, but freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. That was Galatians 5.13 that he just shared. Galatians 5.13. Finding rest after forgiveness. I hope that you've studied this. Uh, Joseph's story, of course, had a very happy ending. As you well know, things turned out for the best. Um, I want to share some things with you here. I want to also focus on page 62 in closing today, uh, the second paragraph in particular. But first... I want to share this with you. It's from page 53 of the companion book. And it says, If we come to God feeling helpless and dependent, as we really are, and in humble, trusting faith make known our wants to him, whose knowledge is infinite, who sees everything in creation, and who governs everything by his will and word, he can and will attend to our cry. And will let light shine into our hearts. Through sincere prayer, we are brought into connection with the mind of the infinite. We may have no remarkable evidence at the time that the face of our Redeemer is bending over us in compassion and love, but this is even so. We may not feel his visible touch, but his hand is upon us in love and pitying tenderness. When we come to ask mercy and blessing from God, we should have a spirit of love and forgiveness in our hearts. And it comes from a little book called Steps to Christ, page 97. In closing this paragraph on page 62, it says, Nothing can justly uh, justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful toward others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. Got that? In God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great heart of infinite love. The tide of divine compassion flows into the sinner's soul and from him to the souls of others. The tenderness and mercy that Christ has revealed in his own precious life will be seen in those who become sharers of his grace. And that's from a little book called Christ's Object Lesson page 251. 
uh, enjoyed being here with you this morning. Your participation that uh, you gave this morning in the study was very good. Thank you very much.